So welcome. It's my pleasure of introducing today's speaker, uh, Professor Oliver Monti, who has a joint appointment as an associate professor in our physics department in our Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And I will cheat and read the title of his talk, When Like Meets Unlike, Electronic Structure and Dynamics at Organic Inorganic Interfaces. Assuming some of you, at least in the front row, are not literate and couldn't have read that yourself. <laughs> so. Um, Dr. Monty comes to us from um, um, Joa was his most recent appointment. Before that, he was at ETH, and he did his degree at Oxford. I promised him I wouldn't remember all that, but I just decided I'll try. And so, with great pleasure, I introduce Professor Oliver Monty. Thank you, Charlie. Well, it is a, uh, a pleasure to be here in optical sciences for once not just driving by, but actually coming down here um, and seeing friends and acquaintances. Um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about the kind of work that's going on in my lab with sort of three vignettes in particular um, that span some of what we do. And for this, I, um, I want to set the scene. And the scene is very simple. This is, in many ways, your life, right? Electronics and data storage. Um, of all sorts, integrated circuits, transistors, hard drives, you name it, all of this to date is basically driven by technology that is certainly evolving and is getting better but has long roots um, at least since the 60s and is rooted ultimately in inorganic, classic inorganic semiconductor materials. Silicon, gallium arsenide, various oxides and so forth and so on. And if you think about it and you look at the periodic table, which uh, as chemists one uh, tends to do once in a while, you see that we're missing perhaps the most powerful part of the periodic table, uh, which is these elements here, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and a few handful of others. This is the realm of organic chemistry. I know that makes me a little bit nervous as well. But if you think about it, um, here you have millions of compounds, in fact, hundreds of millions of compounds that have already been made and more that can be conceived. So the flexibility in generating a new type of object, a new material, is tremendous. Um, and none of that, almost none of that, has found its way into the active components of today's electronic devices. There's the one exception, perhaps, which might be for some of you, you have AMOLED um, screens in your cell phones. Those are based on organic materials. But by and large, we're completely skipping what might be available here. And uh, of course, we know now for some almost 30 years that that's a mistake, that there are some interesting and useful properties that can be harnessed there. Now, um, this meant that people started to make materials, and they really roughly fall into two categories, what people call small molecules. That's things of this sort. This guy here is particularly well known, C60, it's just functionalized. Uh, there's other conjugated molecules. These molecules have one thing in common. They have lots and lots of pi conjugated electrons. So these are things that can be easily delocalized across a molecule. The other class is polymers. Um, those are a little bit harder to make at high purity and, and really um, high quality, but on the other hand, they're much easier to process. Um, and those two classes together um, have been used to make any number of new electronic devices, in particular things that have, in general, this structure down here. A bottom electrode, an organic a schmear in the middle, and a top electrode. You might also make a field effect transistor, in, which you in case you have a third electrode of sorts. Um, and when you do that, it turns out you can make light-emitting diodes, hence the AMOLED screens. You can make photovoltaic cells. Um, this is an example here. Um, you can make transistors. Uh, you can make, actually, uh, thermoelectrics. There's any number of devices that you can make based on this relatively simple structure. And the key seems to lie in what material you use um, as your active matrix, the thing that does the conversion, the optoelectronic conversion. Why might you want to do this? Well, there's the, um, there's the technological pitch. This means that you can make some of these devices ultra lightweight, ultra thin, uh, flexible. Uh, so people dream and to some extent have realized suits that are made 
uh, with, um, with photovoltaic elements in them. Of course, it gets a bit warm over time, but nevertheless, uh, you can carry lightweight power generation with you. You can certainly have lightweight uh, light generation with you. Um, those would be some of the examples. And then scientifically, as I said, the uh, number of different types of materials that you can have using organics is vast and at least in principle promises that you should be able to make very efficient new devices. Now, a lot of the work, so the first insight into this came from the uh, early 70s where someone said, look, I can take two electrodes, aluminium and gold, and I take the organic in between, tetracine, so this is just four fused benzene rings together, I put them in between, and when I do that, I get a photovoltaic cell. Um, the, the efficiency was like 0.001% or something like that, so barely a photovoltaic cell. Nevertheless, this was the first time that anyone had taken something that is generally considered to be an insulator, it's a white powder, and put it into the sandwich and actually made it electronically active. This was a real step to say, huh, all these organic materials that we normally think of as insulators can actually behave, at least in some measure, as uh, semiconductors. This was sufficiently exciting that a lot of effort went into this, slowly at first, but there's a very famous paper by Ching Tang from 1986 where he showed that if you use not one organic but two different organic materials, uh, whatever those two things are, and again, same structure, top electrode, bottom electrode, you sandwich them together, you get a solar cell that now is starting to be a little bit better, like 0.1 to maybe 0.5% efficiency, so that's already a couple orders of magnitude from misery into something that's still poor. Um, however, the insight was that you needed to somehow manipulate the material that is the active matrix, and this has pretty much been the story for the next 30 years. Um, many people have worked on making more and more and more complex materials. So here is something that I'm not even quite sure what it is, but it clearly is quite complex, where someone spends significant synthetic effort to make this, and now we're talking excess of 12% uh, efficiency. That's still only roughly half of a silicon solar cell, but remember that this has other advantages. And also remember that um, this is not the end of it, right? With silicon, we sort of know where, where we're topping out. Um, here, there are certainly uh, uh, future advances possible. But all of this has, by and large, focused on the organic active matrix. Now, I would submit that that's important, but now that we're in some respectable area where we have significant photocurrents, say, for solar cells, or if we're making uh, field effect transistors, we have uh, significant mobilities, and so on. The active matrix may no longer be the key ingredient here. Instead, what you might want to think about is that all these devices ultimately are always based on some sandwich of the organic interacting with electrodes, and it's those electrodes that play a fairly important role. So if I take the example of an organic photovoltaic again, then somewhere deep in the material up here, um, I have a generation of carriers um, by some mechanism, and they get eventually swept towards the electrodes by chemical potential gradients and applied electric fields. And when they do so, uh, uh, they, they, fuse towards, um, they diffuse towards the electrode, and we hope that we can harvest them. So there's a rate constant or a, a flux um, with which these carriers make it from the active layer into the electrode. There is, of course, the reverse process as well. And that one we, you don't want. You don't want carriers to uh, jump back into the active layer um, because that is a, a loss process. And then you also don't want them to pile up near the interface because if they do so eventually, uh, they will find a, a oppositely charged carrier and this will mean that you have annihilation and ultimately you just warm the device up. So it turns out that the, the, the interface between the active layer and the electrode in any reasonable device today tends to be device efficiency determining to a major um, uh, degree. So that suggests that you want to understand what is happening at this interface. And this is uh, beautifully drawn here in the sense that we have uh, just some unstructured two blobs that meet each other. But there is, of course, a lot of physics that's going on here. And that is where one should be paying attention. Now, um, 
remember this is an organic material of some sort with lots of pi electrons, and this is, could be an uh, inorganic semiconductor, it could be a metal, it could be a ferromagnet, it could be any number of things, but those are quite different sorts of uh, uh, objects. Why is this perhaps of interest from the point of view of a uh, physicist? Well, we certainly know how to think about molecules. Think Born-Oppenheimer approximation, so you want to somehow separate electrons from the, from the nuclear motion and so on, and then we can combine various electronic, one electronic wave functions into many electron wave functions, and this has worked out fairly nicely. We have very good supercomputer um, codes that can calculate uh, the electronic and other properties of most molecules to fairly good degree. Um, the key piece here is that your electronic wave function, and we're going to be talking about electrons and holes, are localized to one molecule by and large. Interaction from molecule to molecule is quite weak because that's mostly driven by van der Waals interactions, and those are long range and weak. So by and large, if I put an extra electron on a C60 molecule, this is largely where it's going to spend time, and then once in a while it'll hop to the next C60, and hop to the next C60, and so on. Compare and contrast this to what we know from condensed matter physics, where we have solids, we have Bloch waves, um, and those, of course, are hugely delocalized. The electrons now spend time, um, uh, figuratively speaking, throughout the crystal. And so the question then comes, when you put those two things together, how do you marry this? This should not easily work. If you think about matrix elements uh, that of any operator between this type of uh, electronic wave function and that type of electronic wave function, they ought to be small because I have something that is basically infinitely extended and something that is quite close. So how should I think about that? And indeed, there, is, uh, there are a number of things that happen that reflect directly on this uneasy marriage here um, that really mean that I don't necessarily understand what happens at the interface between molecules and solids in the sense of inorganic solids uh, at all from a conceptual perspective. I certainly cannot take a molecule and a surface of uh, an electrode and say, this is what's going to happen. We are not in that position. In fact, even computationally, we can't do that. Uh, often we're wrong by orders of magnitude when we run current state-of-the-art computational um, efforts. So let me give you a few examples. The first thing that happens is drastic energy level renormalization. So why is that? If I have uh, a charge uh, above a surface, a metal surface, I induce an image dipole, we can calculate that. That's sort of a hydrogenic system. The same, of course, is true if I take a molecule. A molecule is nothing else but a charge distribution, so there will be some sort of image charge distribution induced in the metal uh, surface. Um, and that's dynamic, at least in principle, because the nuclei uh, fluctuate. And so what that means when I look at the uh, electronic energy levels, and here I'm going to look at what we call the transport levels. So those are, for, for chemists, this would be considered the anion and the cation. Um, for physicists, what we would say is those are the conduction band and valence band levels that actually transport the hole and the electron. In the gas phase, we can calculate this, we know, or we can measure this, we know what that is. If we bring this molecule to the surface, there's a dramatic change just through that image dipole interaction or image interaction um, that completely changes what your energy level separation here is. Um, so for benzene, for example, in the gas phase, this gap is, I believe, 9 electron volts. I put it on a gold metal surface, it's 3 electron volts. Yeah, so this is an enormous change. And if I then go and worry about uh, how well would a benzene molecule conduct charge on a surface, I need to know what the relative energy levels are. And what just happened is that I don't know anymore because they get changed so dramatically. Now, um, that's relatively easy to uh, calculate. Actually, the image uh, uh, potential uh, approximations work quite well as long as you don't have very strong interaction across the surface. Um, but it's not the only thing that happens. Accompany this with wave functions and wave function renormalization. So here's a, calcula here's a, a molecule of some sort, again conjugated, that I put on a surface. This is what standard electronic structure theory for a gas phase molecule would tell me. These are the uh, electron densities or the orbitals as calculated uh, by density functional theory. Once I actually include the surface and I treat it properly, which means I have to go beyond density functional theory for reasons that we can discuss offline, this is what happens. So the wave functions 
for these different uh, uh, transport levels get completely changed. So if I wanted to design a device that um, uh, transports charge very nicely to the surface, I would be misled in thinking that this would work quite well if I happen to be, for example, in this level down here, where I have nodes all the way to the surface. This would require fairly large tunneling uh, and therefore would be very slow. So both energy levels and uh, the wave functions get dramatically changed at the interface in ways that can be very difficult to predict a priori. Um, that then uh, is sort of as a corollary. What that will tell you is that you can expect new phenomena to appear at the interface. And I'm just picking four here that I think are quite nice. Um, if you take a molecule and sandwich it, a conjugated molecule and sandwich it between two electrodes, um, and you then measure the thermoelectric, um, uh, the thermal voltage or the, the thermoelectric efficiency, ZT, um, so that's sort of a figure of merit. And uh, current champion uh, materials are somewhere around 1.8, I think. Um, if you do this right, you can get ZT of 6. This is a game changer, right? If this could be experimentally done, we've tried and failed, but if this could be experimentally done, you would have a total game changer in terms of thermoelectric materials. This is a, an area that many people have worked on that is intrinsically and inherently very difficult. Seems like there could be an avenue here. And this is an interfacial effect which has to do with quantum interferences of the way that current flows through this molecule. Wait a minute. Yeah. You said currently it's 1.8. Yep. It's 6 theoretically. Yep. But you told us not to believe the theory. I told, this is good theory, actually. <laughs> okay. uh, this theory has problems still. Um, but it does, it treats, in, in the same sense as this here was relatively good theory, it does things at that level. Right? So that's already much better. It's probably still missing, it is certainly still missing stuff, but it is getting to a point where one can believe it. The problem is that I can't use that theory for any, any old material. It's only simple materials where that will work. Other than that, I run out of steam, basically, computational steam. Um, I can make switches. Uh, for example, I have this little molecule here that looks like a clover leaf. I can put that on a surface, and with a simple stimulus by one electron, I can switch the way that that molecule sits on the surface re uh, reversibly between two different configurations, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So uh, that's a pretty small bit. Uh, it is, of course, serial in the way that you have to address it. Nevertheless, uh, it suggests that there might be ways that we can look at data storage um, that use molecules rather than uh, the usual uh, inorganic uh, materials and oxides. And one that has uh, generated quite a bit of wave, we'll have to see if it really holds up, is that there seems to be uh, a potential to get magnetic materials that are based on organic interfaces, meaning organics with, um, with other materials that go beyond the stoner criterion. The stoner criterion says that you should have a ferromagnet only um, if uh, you have a certain product of the density of states and the exchange coupling strength. So uh, here it seems that we beat that limit um, if the data can be believed and if the, if the interpretation is as suggested and we can have new types of magnetic materials. Negative differential resistance, also something one can do. So the point is, uh, not the detail, but really that you get qualitatively new behavior um, because the interactions between the molecule and the surface can be very complex and go basically beyond one electron pictures. That is the key message that I want to get across. Now, um, there is another class of materials that is rapidly sort of becoming like the new set of organics. Um, and uh, I'm sure you've seen plenty of this. Uh, Two-dimensional materials, starting with graphene and then going into a much wider array of materials, are basically materials that are atomically thin, perfectly ordered, at least in principle, crystals that are layered vertically in front of all stacks. Um, again, van der Waals interactions. This means that one has, in principle, control over making single layers, multiple layers, um, as one wishes, uh, starting from bulk materials. Um, and graphene was the first one that led to the Nobel Prize by Gaim and Novoselov. Um, but since then, there is an ever-expanding sort of two-dimensional periodic table 
uh, where you take some transition metal of some description and you combine it with a chalcogenide, so that would mean sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. That's certainly one option. There are others as well. And those tend to grow in this layered van der Waals fashion, and they have an enormous variety of different electronic properties. And if one of them is not enough for you, you can make so-called heterostacks. You take, for example, a molybdenum disulfide, and you stack it on top of a tungsten disulfide, and you can make a stack with two, you can make a stack with more than two, and this allows you to tailor the electronic structure of these materials almost ad infinitum. And if that's not enough, then you can also change the relative orientation of these layers with respect to each other and by twisting them, and this gives yet another set of uh, degrees of freedom that you can introduce. Um, Interestingly, these are much like organic semiconductors. They're also excitonic semiconductors, if they are semiconductors. So they, there are properties that sort of translate between the two, even though they're quite different materials classes. These are amazing materials. If you look at their band gaps, um, they span anything from basically a semi-metal slash metal all the way to a high band gap, uh, high band gap insulator, boronitride or HBN. And then in between, you have uh, just about any band gap that you might wish to hit. Um, some of them are strongly strain dependent. So black phosphorus has a slightly sort of buckled uh, crystal structure. And if I apply strain along one direction, I can dramatically change the band gap. Um, <coughs> and, and so there is actually a wide range of, of, uh, of electronic and optical properties, which means that they are naturally made for um, good uh, or certainly for interesting, uh, they're, they're of high interest to try and make electronic devices with them. They also span a huge phase diagram. You get anything from metals and semiconductors to insulators, superconductors, and some of the materials can actually undergo phase transition as a function of temperature or charge density or uh, pressure. Um, so there's a, a lot of variability, and they have often quite complicated phase diagrams. There are charge density wave phases and so on. Um, here, too, correlation, the fact that we can't just look at things in the one electron picture, um, really matters. Now, just one example that is sort of the, 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 I would say, the poster child of examples of what is special about them is that if you look at molybdenum disulfide, this is really nothing else but... Um, uh, engine lubricant. Molly is what people put in as a lubricant. Why? Because the different van der Waals sheets can shear easily, so that helps to lubricate. Uh, you can get this in bulk, and if you look at this, as an indirect band gap semiconductor, right? So we have the, the band maximum as a gamma, and then the band minimum, uh, conduction band minimum is somewhere inside the Brillouin zone. By the time you peel this down to a single layer, just one monolayer, something quite traumatic happens. It becomes a direct band gap semiconductor. So if you did photoluminescence measurements, it's dark as the night, and then suddenly this thing becomes actually quite fluorescent, um, quite strongly so, and particularly at low temperature, it's very strong and, and, and readily visible. It also absorbs like 2% of the light, the monolayer, right? So just, just uh, to say that this is no mean feat. Why is that? Well, it has to do ultimately with quantum confinement. If we look at the wave functions in um, bulk MOS2, um, then at the gamma point, you can see there's a significant amount of electron density that is between the sheets. Uh, but at the K point, not so much. And then what happens as we go to the monolayer uh, is that at the K point, uh, this by and large stays. But now at the gamma point where you are somehow terminating this wave function now, this introduces a large effect. And that uh, drops the gamma point down such that the K point suddenly becomes the, uh, uh, the valence band maximum. That, at least, is the current understanding. It's still maybe marginally contentious, but generally people believe that. So with all of that, my lab here at the U of A is interested in combining uh, structure and electronic structure measurements with dynamics on the ultra-fast time scale. We cover typically everything from picoseconds down to attoseconds, and transport measurements for uh, such interfaces of both organic and 2D semiconductors um, with the perspective of how can we help understand uh, the, the properties so that one can actually compose a device um, maybe at will. And so what I will do is I will give you 
three different vignettes of the kind of things that we do. I will not tell you much about structure measurements. We do low temperature STM, scanning tunneling microscopy, so that we know at an atomic level what we're looking at. We do, I will also not tell you much about transport measurements. We do transport measurements on single quantum structures to understand quantum transport because that is inherently an interfacial problem. I will mostly tell you things about dynamics. And so uh, just to situate ourselves what that means, in an ideal situation, what you want is you want to understand, uh, you want to have methods that allow you uh, to look at ground and excited states somehow. So this will mean that we're going to use photons of some description. You want to be able to time resolve this, as I said, femto to pico, rato to pico seconds. You want it to be interface sensitive. So transient absorption and things of that nature or multidimensional electronic spectroscopies will usually not work. Um, sometimes it's useful to be element selective so that I can look specifically on both sides of the interface if they are not made up of the same. And then you want some connection to some electronic structure um, notion and, and, and theory. How do we do that? This is the sort of the kitchen sink that we throw at this. Uh, so I would uh, say our lab is an ultra-fast surface science lab. This means that we do um, surface science in ultra-high vacuum using uh, various forms of photoemission spectroscopy, which I'll talk about in some detail. Well, we use uh, optical spectroscopies uh, in collaboration with colleagues in Germany that allow us to look at fractions of a monolayer, very, very sensitive. We use X-ray spectroscopies to get the element selectivity. I'll tell you a bit more about that. We combine that with density functional theory, the uh, caveat notwithstanding. This is the best one can do for the most part today. And we do uh, various sorts of uh, multi-photon uh, uh, photoemission experiments, photoelectron spectroscopies, uh, and of course, scan probe microscopy. So the first vignette that I want to tell you about is uh, the notion that perhaps we can uh, think about spin as a uh, quantity that we want to understand at an interface. And this is driven by the idea that you can make things called spin valves uh, with organic materials. Those have been demonstrated, it's probably about... 15 years now for the first uh, organic spin valves. And their generic, uh, again, generic layout looks like this. You have a ferromagnet, an organic active layer, and a ferromagnet. And the reason to use organics is because they're made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. These all have low nuclear charge. That means that spin-orbit coupling doesn't play a big role. And if you want to transport spin, you don't want it to be scrambled through spin-orbit coupling so, and hyperfine splitting and so on. This is usually a problem when you do this in dilute magnetic semiconductors. Uh, that was one of the issues with the spintronic community in the 90s. So this promises to have much longer spin coherence times or lifetimes, which means that you should be able to uh, salvage spin over uh, significant distances and therefore make relatively readily a functional device. This was demonstrated, as I said, about 15 years ago. Here's just one example. The idea is that you um, have the magnetization of the two electrodes parallel or anti-parallel. And as a function of that, there is a, a different resistance for current to flow from one ferromagnet to the other. The um, realization often involves this molecule here, um, which is called ALQ3. And one sees this uh, this bias voltage dependent magneto resistance that if you do it right and at reasonably not super low temperatures but a little bit cold, you can get fairly large magneto resistance. And there was a uh, theoretical proposal that suggested that this was primarily driven um, by uh, the interface between the organic and the ferromagnet, that there was something special that was going on there. This first proposal um, uh, basically which measured this just had some random or I should say arbitrary states there that weren't clear but it claimed that there were these low-lying states and those would determine uh, the magneto resistance. How was not completely clear? The, the, it would be about 200 nanometers, something like that. Um, limited by uh, current uh, capabilities, right? If, if we could have better uh, spin transport, we could make them thicker. That's, that's the thought, yeah. So, but it was not clear why it should be as good as it is. If you look at the transport levels of this molecule here, um, then those are a long way away from the Fermi uh, level, so it's not clear what's actually transporting. 
There was a theoretical uh, uh, follow-up uh, by Stefano Sanvito in uh, Trinity College in Dublin, and he said, look, we can understand that quite easily. So if you look on the left-hand side, we have our ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic electrode with a uh, split density of states, and we have this molecule, just an arbitrary molecule, that's a long way away from the surface, where the two different spins are degenerate. Um, but by the time I bring this molecule close to the surface, a number of things happen. First of all, the energy levels change because of the renormalization effects I told you earlier. They shift, but they shift differently depending on spin. That's because they interact differently with the two densities uh, of the, the exchange split uh, densities in the ferromagnet. And if that happens, then it might just be that I get a high density of states of one spin that sits right near the Fermi energy, and that type of density of states is then responsible for uh, filtering spin in and out of the, um, uh, out of the uh, active material. Um, there was then some evidence by Wiesendanger and co. Uh, with spin-resolved STM that did show that spin up and spin down for this molecule, whatever that may be, on the surface does look different, saying that there is indeed a spin-dependent interaction with the surface. <clears throat> so we saw this and we thought, hmm, if that's the case, perhaps we can use this to make an ultra-fast uh, spin filter. So how would we do that? Here's the idea. So again, we have the spin split density of states uh, on, say, on cobalt, our ferromagnet. We have an organic, which has now in the uh, valence band this density of states. And what we're going to do is we're going to populate the conduction band, if you prefer. We call them LUMO for lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. It's the same thing, by and large. We are going to populate that. And uh, because that's going to come with, and we do that with an uh, ultra-fast laser pulse, and then that's going to lead to selective charge transfer, which must somehow be spin conserving from the density of states into the molecule. It could also be reverse. It could be from the molecule into uh, the ferromagnet. And if that happens, then I should get preferentially only one spin being injected. So I have a spin filter, and that should occur on really fast timescales. That was the original idea. Now, how do we measure these things? The, uh, the workhorse for these kinds of experiments is photoelectron spectroscopy or photoemission. This is the Wikipedia image of when you look up uh, what photoelectron spectroscopy is. And um, if you don't practice this, the idea is very simple. It's the Einstein photoelectric effect. You have some light source that um, has an energy, the photons have an energy that exceed uh, the uh, ionization energy of the surface, or what we call the work function. The electrons get chucked out. You collect them. You collect them as a function of angle. Uh, that gives you band structure because the momentum has to be somehow conserved, uh, at least the in-plane momentum. And then you energy filter them with uh, a hemisphere, for example, where you apply a radial electric field um, and then collect them. And you can do this with very high sensitivity. Uh, this is an electron counting setup uh, where we see one electron at a time. Now, the standard way to do this is what we would call ARPES, or angle result photoelectron spectroscopy. Photon comes in, electron comes out. You measure the kinetic energy and its momentum. Um, this is good. We're going to use some of that. But you can do this in a slightly more uh, sophisticated fashion. Instead of using one big photon, use two small photons. Make them short laser pulses. And that allows you to do pump probe spectroscopy for one which gives you, if the laser pulses are femtoseconds, then that gives you femtosecond time resolution. And for another, it gives you conduction band information, which you will never be able to get from this, because you can only eject an electron from the valence band or lower, because you need an electron to be in there in the first place. So this we call two-photon photoemission. This is a not very common approach. Uh, that's one of the main legs that my lab stands on. So we're going to use those two to look at the electronic structure at this interface, and then at the back end here, we'll have a spin filter that allows us to analyze, or a spin analyzer that allows us to analyze the spin. So, yep, exactly, exactly. So this is not the full spin valve, right? We remove the top electrode. We're just going to look at the spin filtering aspect of cobalt with ALQ3 on top. No, much thinner. So one of the uh, aspects that uh, photomission gives you is that it is very interface sensitive. It can only probe a very small little area somewhere around about, depends on your energy range, but say no more than a nanometer. So this allows me to really look at the interface and the interface only. 
And then if I don't want to see the interface, I just pack more ALQ3 on top, and then I see only the molecule. Right? So this is sort of the trick that we play here. Uh, in the two-photon photo emission, it's a visible and a UV photon. In the uh, RPES, it's a deep UV photon. Yeah, I know, but, but you, you said you're doing the two-photon. Yep, lab. yep. And you're using visible photons. Yep. So it penetrates much more than Oh, it does, but the electron doesn't escape. That's a matter of electron scattering, which is very large, and it's really the escape depth that limits the probing depth. You're absolutely right. Of course, the, the penetration even of X-rays would be much deeper, right? But it's the escape depth that, that uh, limits our probing volume. The polarization in the case of this experiment, we tend not to control it. That's an unpolarized source. And here, uh, we do control it, and we can look at all combinations. Uh, it matters for some states because of selection rules at the surface. But it, uh, for other states, it does not matter. Depends a little bit what the state is that you're looking at. So. The first thing that you need to see to convince yourself that there is a hope of getting such a fast spin filtering is that you have interaction between the molecule and the surface. There's a lot of data here. The main thing is really shown in the summary diagram here, where we did all the due diligence. We did the spectroscopy, and we said, we know where our molecular valence band is, the conduction band, uh, in bulk. Then when we get to the interface, we know it shifts a little bit. That's the renormalization. And then we see two new states. We call them HIS for hybrid interface state, occupied and unoccupied, that only exist at the interface. This is a hallmark of interaction between the molecule and the surface. Right? They only exist in that first monolayer. They go away after that. We know that through that limited probing depth of the uh, photomission experiment. And you can see them. Uh, uh, you can see them in, in here. You can see them also by doing two-photon photomission. And one does uh, a lot of work to convince oneself that that's true. You, you scan your photon energy over large ranges. Um, and you, you prepare these interfaces in many different ways, and this is indeed uh, what comes out. So key point, the first step is to see that there is interaction. The second step is to see if that interaction leads to spin polarization of some sort, meaning that we have an imbalance in some way or form um, uh, of uh, spin density for spin up and spin down. Uh, so we first did a uh, momentum-resolved photomission spectroscopy of these interface states to see that they do not disperse at all. So the band structure is flat, and that's a hallmark of it being molecular in character. Right? If this was cobalt, it would be dispersive in some form or fashion. So this is telling us, indeed, this is a state that carries molecular character. And then if we um, do the photomission and we measure uh, how many spins up and down we get, um, in this excited state here, this is the one that we want. Remember, we want to inject into it or from it. Um, uh, then we see that we do get, this is properly normalized, uh, a different extent, similar shape, but different extent of spin up versus spin down. So there's spin polarization. We do see both spins, but there's spin polarization present. What's your, your detector? This, this is a... Um, uh, uh, a uh, so the way you do this is you use a iridium crystal um, of particular cut, and uh, you have the photoelectrons at the back end of the analyzer impinge on that crystal, and then you take a particular reflection of that. And, that, and, and the plus one and the minus one reflection are actually spin polarized. <clears throat> they, they are horrendously inefficient. You lose about 10 to the 6 or so. It's just awful. The very best ones now, the newest versions, you, you pay a penalty of maybe a factor 100, but here we, had, we lost about a million, factor of a million, or maybe 100,000. So you, these experiments take an awful lot of effort to actually get a curve like this. Um, so um, again, this is our, uh, our energy level scheme here. So we excite that hybrid interface state in that first layer. And now we're going to ask, what is the lifetime of that excited state? Um, how does it evolve in time? Um, and so for this, we do the time-resolved pump probe uh, two-photon photoemission spectroscopy. 
And you get curves that look something like this. And you see that there's a small difference here. When you zoom in, you see it's actually a larger difference. You use a three-level optical Bloch equation system to try and resolve that dynamic. But the first thing that you see is that the lifetime is spin-dependent. Spin up and spin down do not have the same lifetime. So that was not quite what we had planned. We thought we would get spin-selective injection. That's not what we saw. But what we ended up seeing was that we have spin dependent lifetime. So maybe uh, this is still good. When we extract that and we measure the spin lifetimes, uh, the spin resolved lifetimes of that excited molecular state which accepted an electron from the cobalt, um, here is what we see as a function of energy. Still here. Uh, as we scan across the different energies, this is roughly where our hybrid interface state is. You see that the lifetime of the spin-up uh, state is about 400 femtoseconds, and that of the spin-down state is almost twice that, 800 femtoseconds. And you might say, well, that's short, and that's nice, um, but so what? Well, in cobalt, I do that same measurement, and the lifetimes are like 10 femtoseconds or less. This follows Fermi liquid theory. Um, and so this is an extraordinarily long lifetime of a carrier at a metal interface. You would expect it to be quenched very quickly because of energy transfer into the bath of all electrons uh, that are residing in a cobalt. So something really slows down uh, that lifetime. And of course, that is another hallmark of interaction between the molecule which has a much different density of states and different electron correlation, hybridization of that with the surface. So what this is telling us is that origin originally we populate uh, the same amount, as far as we can tell, of spin up and spin down electrons, but then the spin up ones decay relatively quickly, whilst the spin down ones survive for a certain amount of time. So what this is saying is that we have a dynamic spin filtering process here. Um, it happens on short time scale, um, but the idea is that there is a barrier um, that comes about from the specific interaction of the molecule with the surface that prevents uh, back transfer, rapid back transfer in the spin down channel, but uh, allows it at least somewhat in the spin up channel. And so at this interface, what you really generate is then a fast spin filtering uh, process. So that is just one example of what one can do at, uh, at such interfaces. Let me give you a second vignette. You said up and down, you're referring to the spin dimension of cobalt, right? That's right, exactly. Are they are perpendicular, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one, I'll, I'll say here that the dirty little secret is you have to really be careful not to get any oxide on the cobalt because that will scramble the spin direction, right? And so we pay uh, a lot of attention in making sure that we're not forming oxides as best as we can. Um, and we prepare these surfaces fresh every time by evaporating cobalt um, over and over again and make sure that the chamber is clean. So but they're in-plane magnetized? They're in-plane magnetized, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not perpendicular magnetized, yeah. Right. That, so that you have, that's... This is HCP cobalt, yeah. This is HCP cobalt, yeah. It's on, grown on copper 111, so that'll make it HCP. Okay, second vignette, different sort of material, now layered, um, from the Waals like with slightly different properties. Um, I don't want to dive too deep into topological insulators, but just to say that a regular semiconductor or insulator has a band structure that looks something like this. You have a valence band, you have a conduction band, there's no spin splitting usually uh, for silicon or something like that, or very small, and these... Um, uh, bands are symmetric with respect to taking an electron that has a momentum, say, plus k, and a, uh, uh, an electron that has a momentum of minus k. There is no difference uh, there. Now, <clears throat> if I introduce strong spin-orbit coupling, and I can do that by going to um, elements that have a high nuclear charge, um, for example, you see here in bismuth selenide, there, there's bismuth and there's selenium in there, then that spin-orbit coupling will mean that my bands are uh, splitting up into spin-up and spin-down parts, and they are no longer reflection symmetric with respect to uh, the zero momentum point, meaning an electron out here has a different uh, spin than must have a different spin than an electron over there. And this gives rise to this topological protection, meaning that electrons up here cannot easily scatter because there's no place they can go to. Uh, 
And they would have to uh, change spin as well, and that, that's at least in principle forbidden. Um, when you have that, then there must also be a new set of states that appear inside the band gap that connect the uh, same spin symmetries, and these are surface bands that form a Dirac cone like so. Um, <clears throat> and that leads ultimately to the connection of spin and momentum. The classic material uh, that does this is bismuth selenide. It's a layered van der Waals layered material that comes in, in multiple uh, layers in one unit cell. Now, for this particular type, and because it's a layered material, the, um, the spin texture, the fact that spin and momentum are connected with each other, that spin texture is a surface phenomenon. So that suggests that perhaps you can actually tailor this. That was the, the thought that we had, and we thought, well, we know, you know we can rain a bunch of metal atoms or something like that on there, but maybe a much more uh, sophisticated way of doing this, where we have more tunability, is to use organic molecules, organic semiconductors in particular. So here is the Gedanken experiment that we wanted to do. Let us imagine that we have some molecule that interacts very weakly with the surface. This falls into the realm of what people would call physisorption. And in that case, the only thing that happens is you change energy levels around a little bit, but nothing, nothing serious happens. So that's the situation that I'm showing here. You have your topological insulator material, and then inside, uh, and then uh, what you did is you mildly doped it uh, either by uh, pulling electrons out a little bit, by exchange correlation, or maybe by pushing electrons into the surface a little bit, and that will shift the Fermi energy a tad. Then let's take that molecule and let's get it closer to the surface. This is what's drawn here. And if I get it close enough, I'm starting to have some sort of bonding type interaction. We would call that chemisorption, perhaps weak chemisorption. And usually the way that that shows up is that you start mixing these localized uh, molecular states with, um, with states from the surface. And the net result is exactly what we saw in the ALQ3 cobalt case where we had these hybrid interface states that appear. Those are usually not dispersive, so they show a flat band someplace inside the band structure. Still not exciting, but then maybe if we can push that molecule even closer, where we get to the level where we have really strong interaction, perhaps this is the place where we can influence uh, spin texture. Now, this is, not something, this is not an experiment that you can do. Right? The molecule absorbs however the molecule absorbs. You don't have a lot of control over that. Um, uh, given a surface, that's usually what it does. So uh, we're going to do something a little bit different, and uh, let me walk you through this. So in each case, we're going to measure the band structure, the electronic structure of the material, in the case of, uh, with different types of uh, scenarios of molecules absorbed on the surface. So to begin with, let's just look at what bismuth selenide band structure looks like. And like I told you, here's the Dirac cone. Um, these are the surface states. This is the onset just barely of the conduction band here. Uh, and then uh, if we look a little bit deeper, you see the various uh, valence band levels and deeper that show up. Okay, so this is uh, just a regular band structure. This goes very nicely with uh, calculations that, that uh, were done on this as well. Then we take C60, for which we had good reason to believe that it would interact quite weakly. It would fizzysorb. And let's see if that's the case. We take the molecule, we plop it on there, we measure again the band structure, and we compare and contrast. And you see that, by and large, it looks the same. Right? So particularly in the valence band region and near the Dirac cone, this looks very much the same. You see the uh, appearance of non-dispersive bands further down. These are the C60 bands of just the molecule. Um, but other than that, all I did is I shifted the rock point around a little bit. Weak interaction as hoped for. Next, so this is the same case again, then I'm going to dial up the extent of interaction. I'm going to do that by taking this molecule here, H2PC. And for H2PC, we had reason to believe that it might interact a bit more strongly, and this turned out, for, we tried a couple of molecules, but this uh, turned out to be fortuitously correct. Um, compare and contrast. Right? So here we have basically the Dirac cone structure and not much else. You still see now uh, there is a presence of the Dirac cone, but there's also this very strong new band here, and that's exactly this hybrid interface state. It is not dispersive. It is uh, really quite flat, um, and uh, that's the hallmark of this hybrid interface state, and also uh, the um, Dirac point shifts around. 
So that would be chemisorption. Now, let's go further and let's modify that molecule. And we just modified it by adding some groups on the outside. And we put it on there. And this is what you get. Now, I would submit that this looks qualitatively different from anything that I've shown you so far. Right, let's just put them all back together. Pristine uh, bismuth diselenide through some weak interaction, through some hybrid interface state, to this. Something very different happened here. And when you look at this and you've seen structures like this before, you realize that this is a case of Rashbaugh splitting. And Rashbaugh splitting is just spin orbit coupling in the condensed phase. And what happens is that you still have uh, your uh, Dirac cone, uh, but in addition, you now have a new set of bands that appear that are split. And they are displaced from each other in K-space, and that's the, that's the hallmark of the Rashbaugh splitting. So we know that those are spin polarized. <clears throat> so what's going on here? Why do you get Rashbaugh splitting? Well, um, we see from the calculations that we have strong spin polarization away from all the time reversal symmetric points, so not at gamma, not at x, but, um, but away from that we get strong spin orbit, uh, uh, spin polarization. And this comes about from, must come about somehow from a uh, electric field. So Rashbaugh splitting just means that you have um, the interaction uh, of, uh, or the creation of a magnetic field of an electron that moves in a, in a potential gradient. This means, so that's the usual thing that we would also say for spin orbit coupling, this means that we must have a potential gradient. The electron uh, uh, movement is, of course, the momentum in the crystal, the, the crystal momentum in the solid. That magnetic field then will split the, uh, your previously spin degenerate state into the two um, spin levels. And that uh, must then also depend on where you do this in the band structure because you get different momentum, different velocity, depending on where you are um, in the band structure. So, for example, at gamma, where P is zero, you would not expect any spin splitting, and lo and behold, you don't. So it's not, it's not, like not at all. This is, this is a non-magnetic bismuth selenide. Uh, the direction is the in-plane uh, direction. Uh, because it's a layered material, you're purely in, in that first layer. So how do you know it's going one layer to start it? Ah, uh, that's the momentum direction that we measure in the band structure. right? So, so as we measure the band structure, uh, in the Brillouin zone, we know that we can go from gamma to plus x or gamma to minus x. Those are two different momenta. And this is how we, how we measure. This is what we get from the experiment. So the question is, what is this potential gradient here? Well, if we look carefully, uh, what we see is that there's actually quite enormous band bending. Band bending just means that when you have charges at the surface, those do not get properly screened. This then induces an extra electric field, which will now need to be added to the energy of the conduction band and the valence band. Um, and because we interact so strongly between the molecule and the surface, there is a lot of charge displacement that happens. That is what creates the electric field. That leads to strong band bending. It is that band bending that leads to the potential gradient, the existence actually of a two-dimensional electron gas, if you really uh, want to dig into this in a quantum well. But it's this potential gradient that together with the momentum in the crystal generates the Rashbaugh splitting. And so when we compare and contrast to the weak coupling, then in that case, uh, all we did is we modified the overall electronic structure a little bit, uh, but the spin texture arises in a sort of new fashion, in a, in a, in a totally different way, uh, purely from uh, the electronic interaction between the molecule and the surface. So this is something you can do by using molecules, um, uh, and you can create qualitatively new behavior. Third and last vignette, um, just to highlight a different spectroscopic approach. Um, again, layered materials. Let us look at a bulk layered material. And we might ask, what do we know about the interaction layer to layer versus intralayer? And what does that mean for carrier dynamics? If I inject an electron, what will it, what, how will it behave? Uh, and what are its time scales for motion in the plane versus motion out of the plane? Um, and because it is often said that the true two-dimensional limit is really only reached at the monolayer. How do you do this? Well, if you have a way of probing directionally, uh, 
um, uh, the electronic structure, then you might do that. So if I can, for example, excite orbitals that are primarily in plane versus orbitals that are out of plane, this might be uh, allowing me to access this. How much time do I have, actually? Minus five? Minus five. Yeah. Minus five. Then let me not go into details here, but and I'm going to skip this here. We use X-ray spectroscopy to do this. This is resonant X-ray spectroscopy that we call core hole clock spectroscopy, where the idea is very simple. We have a clock that we know that's the Auger decays of core excited electrons um, or, or molecules or surfaces. And we can beat against that any other process, which might, for example, be carrier transport. Okay? And since that decay here is A, well known, and B, very fast, so on the order of 1 to 10 femtoseconds, this allows us to access very short time scales uh, that way. I will not tell you all the details. This is sort of what the data looks like. You go to a synchrotron to do that, and you spend happy uh, sets of 24 hours getting all that data. And when you do that and analyze it all, um, ultimately here is what you get. So what I'm showing you here is the X-ray absorption spectrum in gray, and then the extracted lifetimes as a function of energy. And all you need to know is that we have the conduction band minimum, where A1 is, and then we have... Uh, points away from the conduction band minimum where B1 is energy-wise. And if you look at the carrier lifetimes, you see there's a dramatic difference. Uh, in fact, quantitatively, uh, our carrier lifetimes are about 400 attoseconds in the conduction band minimum region, but they are about factor 10 higher um, away from the conduction band minimum. Uh, I also want to highlight just how short these time scales are. Um, why is this? Well, near the conduction band minimum, that conduction band minimum is mostly made up of some tin 5s and some PXY orbitals that are in-plane orbitals. Whilst away from the conduction band minimum, we start to mix in PZ orbitals. So away from the conduction band minimum, we're probing processes that preferentially go this way, whilst in, near the conduction band minimum, we're probing processes that are in-plane. So what this is saying is that we have in-plane very short lifetimes, out of plane, relatively long lifetimes, and so dynamically on short time scales, even a bulk material that is layered already behaves as a two dimensional, purely two dimensional material. So on short time scales, I don't need to go through the trouble of preparing monolayers and so on. On short time scales, I have intrinsically a 2D material. So let me summarize to not overstay my welcome here. Um, I uh, just want to say that um, or, uh, what I've shown you is that organic semiconductors and two-dimensional materials are excitonic in nature. They are very tunable, have a lot of flexibility to them, and because uh, much is determined by the interfaces of these materials with other things, there are new, th there are new properties that we can extract. I showed you that we can have spin filtering. I showed you that we can do spin texturing. And I basically didn't show you that we have very fast uh, and uh, uh, anisotropic uh, dynamics in these materials uh, on very fast time scales. What remains to be done is to highlight the people who've done the work that I showed you. Kali Eads was working on the X-ray spectroscopy with Dima Bandak. David Raki was uh, uh, working on some of the spin filtering. And there should be another red name someplace who uh, worked on the, uh, on the Rashba splitting. And then these are some of the collaborators and my funding sources. And thank you once again very much for your attention. Thank you.